Hello, welcome to the Documentary Media Centre for this evening's Reportage Club and I've been joined by Corson Hefferge. How are you? I'm good. Yeah. Good, good. Well, thank, thank you very you. much for joining us this evening. Now, I've done a Reportage Club with you before yeah. about your main project, sort of Colours of Leicester. So tell us a little bit about that in a sentence. If I was to meet you oh. for the first time, what is Colours of Leicester? Um, it's a photojournalism project where I go around in the street, take a photo of someone, talk to them for a bit and then I post it on Instagram. Okay, and how many have you done there? Ooh. Is it 60? I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, it's, it's quite a yeah, lot, isn't it? Yeah. You're also talking about you wanted to make some film ones as well, actually. Yeah. You're thinking about that. So. Yeah, I think I want to move into like film as well because I feel like with the photos I take, you take you take a little snapshot like someone, but filmed, you actually get to see their facial expressions. The you know you get to like see a bit more about that person. So yeah. I think yeah, I do want to like delve into film. And you're nearly coming to the end of your first year at the University of Leicester. Tell yeah. us what course you're on. So I study politics and international relations. Okay. Um, yeah, and the first year has gone so fast. Enjoying like, it? Yeah, yeah. That's the it's main really thing. Yeah. Now, the subject for uh, tonight's conversation is uh, one that was given to us by Tina, actually, which is for International Women's Day, which was around women reporting conflict. So mm -hmm. we've gone for seven people. Um, not yeah. particularly focusing on photographers only, which yeah. a lot of people tend to do. Yeah. Um, tried to, and people that I personally stand out for me, stood out for Tina, and hopefully you'll enjoy the conversation and the people that are here tonight yeah. with us. Okay. Yeah. So what we're going to do is, I want to start off with, why is this subject of interest to you? Because we've had this conversation before mm. about you know sort of conflict reporting, you know that kind of stuff, and I know Durian in particular is interested in conflict reporting mm. as well. Why, why do you think it's such a, a subject of interest to young mm. people? That I think I think everyone has their own view, but like for me personally, I think there's so much going on in the world right now, um, and a lot of the time I kind of feel helpless, like watching the news, and it's like I really want to do something about it. So I think when when I like started looking into photojournalists and people who actually go into the foreground and actually report on these stories and raise awareness on the issues that are happening in the world, I feel like that's the best way for me to actually showcase what's happening in the world and like be the person out there telling people what's actually happening. Um, and yeah, and I felt like I felt like I connected with that. I connected with that profession, so I was like, I want to pursue that. It's interesting you mentioned there about people that are in the foreground. Yeah. Um, so they're actually where it's happening. Yeah. One picks that out of some of the people that we're going to talk about yeah. this evening, about those that were kind of held slightly back and then those that were kind of really in it and different different bits and pieces that I've right. discovered. Um, from your point of view, where would you say, if you were able to go now, where would you go? If you had the money to get on a plane mm. and three months to go, camera in your pocket, where would you go? So where, where do you think needs reporting that's not really reported very well maybe for the mainstream? Mm -hmm. Two places for me, Rohingya. Um, in Myanmar, the Rohingya Muslims, um, and the Uyghur Muslims in, in China, the okay. Uyghur camps. Yeah. Okay. And that's interesting because what you've got there is two um, sort of Muslim communities mm. as well. Uh, one that's very much kind of hidden um, in yeah. China. Um, we, we've sending messages out, yeah. it comes into the mainstream media. Really interesting now whether how China's reacting to the coronavirus, so that will actually date our video <laughs> um, in, in, the middle of that, in the middle of that sort of outbreak at the moment and how they're using that around human rights because a lot of people have been talking about sort of the impact on civil liberties and stuff in yeah. China. And then the one with the, the Rohingya, obviously, mm. predominantly in Bangladesh, is the mm. fact that you know, they, they were stateless when they were thrown out, so they've actually got nowhere to go back to because exactly. Myanmar says, well, they were never part of yeah, our country at exactly. all, and, and how that kind of stuff develops. What do you think about, when I say to you, we're not covering that subject? What is it about that issue that we're not covering, do you think? I think it's just their stories, their struggle, um, the fact that they are going through this thing right now where um, they, they're being attacked. Like, I think, I don't know if you'd classify it as a genocide, some people have, um, but the fact that it's not in the mainstream media, so there are other things that are being spoken about, but um, it's something that people are like forgetting about, people not talking about, and I think some people have like drawn similarities with um, the other genocides that have happened, like in Rwanda and places like that, how the world was just so silent when it was happening, and um, people feel like history is repeating itself again. One of the interesting things preparing for this evening, talking about those kind of subjects and what these women had covered, yeah. and you talk about um, genocides and stuff, and mm. of course what you had with the Rohingya was the fact that we've actually got satellite imagery now. Yeah. Um, a lot of stuff in Africa particularly was uh, championed by um, George Clooney when it came to putting money into mm. um, 
uh, NGOs that kind of use satellite images to kind of prove where different people are and of course they've got the evidence now of the Myanmar army sort of you know burning villages replacing villages and in, in some instances actually building other stuff so they can't actually yeah. ever return because yeah. they've replaced other stuff do you think now is as good a time as any to be a conflict reporter because really you could get on a plane with your passport some money mm. in your pocket mm. your smartphone don't even need mm, a camera exactly. these days and actually go off and be a conflict reporter mm. yeah. Um, I was actually talking to my sister about this before. Um, the thing is, like back then, uh, well, I'm saying back then, but like in the 20th century, um, I felt like there weren't that many reporters out there. We didn't have, like, technology wasn't as advanced, so we needed people to go out there um, to tell us what was happening in the world. But now, because everyone has their own phone, I feel like you can say, you can argue that, like, now the people who actually live there can report their own stories. Um, but then I think. It, we do need more conflict reporters because I think everyone has their own like take and their own view of like what's actually happening in the world. And so if we have more people going out there, I think we can get like more of an authentic story as well. Mm. Um, because yeah, I think I think there's always a need for journalists out there. It'd be interesting because the last person we'll talk about this evening, Marie Colvin, yeah. who worked for the Sunday Times and was killed in 2012 in, in Oms in, in Syria, yeah, yeah. was one of those big personality, well-known foreign correspondents. And really now, um, with you know travel restrictions, smaller budgets for the media, yeah. really the, the role of a local reporter now is not so much as a fixer, but more mm. as about actually someone can actually tell you that what's going on in the ground if they can't get access. So yeah. I'm thinking of Syria in particular, yeah. some of the documentaries that have come out. Yeah. Um, around that. Okay, so let's let's dive into our first person. Okay, yeah. so our first person we're going to deal with um, is Claire Hollingworth. So that's that's the photo that I want to look at, and we'll, we'll whiz that round everybody. Now the interesting thing about Claire is she was actually born in Knighton, mm. not far from here. Yeah. So um, and um, when she died in 2017, she was 105. Yeah. So you know that's 107, 108 years ago uh, that she was born yeah. in Knighton. Um, very kind of. Uh, you know, for only, only as a child, you know, mm. born there, moved on, worked in different places. Mm. And she's obviously very famous for being the first war correspondent to report the outbreak of World War II. Yeah. So um, legend goes she um, shanghaied the car um, yeah. from the Consular General, was driving near the border with uh, Poland and Germany, mm. and the wind blew, these big sort of nets blew up, and there was a Panzer German division. Mm. And of course, they didn't believe her so she had to get on the phone and as the tank started yeah. rumbling put the, the phone out you can't imagine that now as well because we've got the benefit of hindsight of world war Two being yeah. sort of you know six seven years long yeah. um, at the time that must have been quite as a woman quite yeah. interesting as well yeah what from your research that you did about claire yeah. what did you what did you kind of pick out um i felt like she she was very brave. I think all the women that we'll discuss like they're very brave and they have like this running theme of, of just persevering and trying to find the, the story. Um, and I think with Claire specifically, she I think I think I was like I was watching um, a video on uh, an interview that she had and she was talking about how she always loved being in the in the foreground or like she loved being with action. So like she had so much passion about what she did and like um, yeah she just always wanted to be there, um, be there where the action was was taking place and like. I think her passion really shows with what she did, um, and yeah, and especially because it was in like it, it, back then it was like oh, it was like a man's job to actually be a journalist, um, especially like a war correspondent, um, and I think she did like a, an amazing job. Yeah, I think she'd only been working for the Telegraph for a week, and oh, it was wow. one of her first assignments. Um, and I think it took a couple of days as well. I'm not even sure she got a byline for it as well when it came back. Oh. So, um, so it kind of history reflects well yeah. on the fact that she was that lady. I've got an interesting cartoon that's just above your head here when she passed away in 2017, and it said Claire was we greatly missed. Who's going to tell us when Trump starts World War Three? So yeah. she was known as the person that yeah. broke the fact that yeah. World War Two started. One of the things that I, I, I found really interesting yeah. as well is she just comes across as this really kind of quite a scary character as, as, as a lot of these women are they're kind of because they're so forceful and they're so determined and you know they're obviously they're battling all of the prejudices around a man's world and where they are and then they're in the conflict zone as mm. well um, and some of them have certain features that make them look quite feminine we'll come on to mm. Dickie Chappelle with her pearly rings mm. and the Catherine Leroy's you know shock of blonde mm. hair um, she would stand out mm. amongst people whereas you look at any of the photos of Claire particularly mm. on the display outside mm. she kind of just going about her business very much in, in, in that way. Mm. Um, that um, She's kind of getting on with it. She's there because she's a journalist and she's a reporter. Mm. Um, do you think there's a lot to be learned about that um, 
when it comes to how to act and just be what you want to be rather than having to fit a stereotype. For sure. I feel like if, if Claire felt comfortable dressing like that and, and acting how she was, then that's, that's fine for her. And I feel like some of the journalists that we'll talk about, um, if they wanted to show their femininity, um, then that's also fine. I feel like you don't have to look a certain way to, to be at the foreground. Um, and I think sometimes... I don't know if women feel like they need to change their appearance because, especially back then, when you're in like a man's world, do I need to change my appearance to just fit in and make sure no one like to, to basically not um, draw too much attention to themselves? Um, so, so yeah, so it was it was a really interesting yeah. Review when I was reading and, about and, it. and when you look at the at the images uh, or the fo photos of all of these women in particular, which will look at their photos as well of them as well as the photos they took. Um, what you'll notice is now is, I think, now we have this sort of cult of celebrity in the mainstream media, and that recently, um, in the last sort of five, six years, mm -hmm. quite a few well-known female uh, photographers have been sort of, you know, physically assaulted, sexually assaulted during sort of, you know, short periods of time yeah. um, in sort of Egypt, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, obviously in things like places like Syria, Afghanistan and stuff, that, you know, a lot of the people turn around and say, well, I bl we blame them because of, you know, having their head uncovered, blonde hair, yeah. you know, what they were wearing, they shouldn't have been in that situation. Mm -hmm. And it's a really interesting point in blame. And one particular um, journalist uh, wrote a book about her experience of, of being attacked, a mother of two, being mm -hmm. attacked and, and being raped. And uh, basically everybody turned against her and, and mm -hmm. said, we don't really want to know about this. You know, we want our sort of reporters doing their job rather than mm -hmm. that. And so there's that extra added bonus, yeah. isn't there, of, of the sort of the threat of doing these kind of yeah, things as well. For sure. Always, always, always evident. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next person now, and this is um, Gerda Taro, who I think is an absolutely fascinating character. Mm -hmm. um, again, another one who died sort of very young, yeah, if yeah. you like. Um, and she's one of those people as well, it's a bit like Martha Gellhorn, you know, Gerda Taro tends to be named alongside Robert Kappa. Yeah. Um, Martha Gellhorn tends to be named alongside Ernest Hemingway. And... and and to all intents and purposes from the research that I can do, they're actually much more interesting characters. You know, and the men are sort of, you know, fundamentally flawed in <laughs> being men. And um, whereas the women actually being there are fighting against all of that prejudice. One of the things I never realised mm. was that Robert Kappa was in fact a, a creation between the two of them. So his name is not Robert Kappa because he's Hungarian. Oh. So I think she's a, a, a German Jew. I think it's yeah, what it yeah, said, yeah. 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 Um, and, and she had an, uh, her name as well. And so what they decided, because of the prejudices at the time in Europe, yeah. was to create um, a name to put their photographs at. So Robert Kappa was an invention between the two of them, um, which obviously when she was killed, I think he then took the name on or became more known as, as Robert Kappa. And there's a really interesting one as well. It said in 2011, there was a documentary called The Mexican Suitcase, and they found, um, I think, 40-odd thousand negatives yeah. in a suitcase that had been uh, mm -hmm. undiscovered since the um, Spanish Civil War in 36 to 39. And what they realised was that, in fact, a lot of the photos that were accredited to Robert Kappa were, in fact, taken oh. by Gerda Taro. So, you know, history was quite kind to her in the end. Yeah. But she died quite young. Um, did, yeah. And you know, doing that kind of. What did you find out about her when you were doing your own your, your yeah, own research? Yeah, so pretty much similar things. Um, I found out that she she died when she was like twenty six, twenty seven, mm. um, and she was uh, reporting on the Spanish Civil War, and it was during that time when I think she went on like a on a, a I don't know if it was a bus or something, but they were like wounded soldiers, and that um, truck actually got um, like hit, and that's how she she died. Um, but yeah, so I think Robert Cappy actually ended up giving his negatives to um, a friend of his. And when they actually found the negatives, it was quite hard for them to distinguish like whose like photos were whose. So um, I think someone's like released a book now, like really explaining like how um, Gerda, Gerda Taro, she actually, she, she basically took most of the photos, or like mm. some of them, mm. um, which was really interesting. Yeah. So if you flick onto the next photo, yeah. um, of course, the interesting thing is she was taking square photos at a time when now square photos are Instagram. Um, and so they said that's the way that you can normally tell because uh, Kappa would take um, traditional oh, photographs because okay. he was using a Leica and she was using a different camera which was taking I square images how, okay. and that's how you can normally tell uh, a lot of the images that were hers. Eventually she got into using I think a Leica and took more as you go through sort of 36 to sort of that kind of stuff, okay. uh, 37, she's using that. Of course, she was the first photojournalist that died covering yeah. a frontline war. So um, what I 
think when you reflect back on that as well, how much has happened in the world since mm. she died with photojournalism? What, what do you think? What do you think she would think now of female photojournalists? Wow, I think she's inspired quite a lot of female mm. journalists, um, and I think yeah, I guess like. I think I think she'd be proud about how many journalists are out there right now, because um, I think there's there's so many new like contemporary like uh, uh, journalists right now who are like reporting on refugees, migrants, all of that, um, and yeah, so I think she'd be like really inspired by that. Because a lot of her photos as well are, are not so much war fighting; they're actually sort exactly. of the women and that famous the photo there, yeah. and and sort of children playing and stuff like mm, that in, in mm. bomb sites and stuff. So yeah, I noticed that too. Yeah, it, it was more. She, I think she. I, I don't know if she was like trying to humanize war a bit more, um, but most of her photos were yeah, women and children, um, which I found like really interesting. Yeah, I've got a, a, a book out there about women f uh, war photographers, and it was saying that a lot of people think, oh, you know, f f women war photographers look through the female eye and kind of try to put a female take on it and what they're saying is actually when you look at all of the photographs they don't you know what yeah. I mean it just tends to be there's just as many men as women that are taking the humanitarian view and stuff and Catherine Leroy who we'll come on to in a minute was very much wanted to be at the front mm. all of her things were like battle scenes and stuff yeah. like that she wanted to put a human face to war but from the kind of war fighting yeah. point of view rather than focusing maybe on the victims, yeah. which a lot of the other, the other people have done. Mm. Okay. Cool, so here we go. So we get this one back. So we're going to move on to our um, third person now. And mm. this lady, Martha Gellhorn, that's, um, I feel like we should stand up and salute when we talk about Martha <laughs> Gellhorn. She's amazing. I mean, she, yeah. she was a very well-known American novelist and travel writer before mm. the war mm. um, and had been involved in all, causing all sorts of insurrection um, <laughs> in, in, in America and getting herself yeah. in trouble. Uh, but, of course, she's probably one of the greatest war correspondents mm. of the 20th century simply because I think she was virtually in every major conflict yeah. in the world for like the 60 years of her career. Yeah. Okay, so a real kind of tour de force. Um, and when she was in the Spanish Civil War, um, obviously Ernest Hemingway was uh, at the same time as well. Mm. And um, lots of other artists and authors had gone. Um, and he, he was there and lots of other people as well. And of course, what they're finding is they're all moving around supporting the Republican, yeah. um, the Republican movement against, as we now know, the fascist ideology that then become the Nazis mm. and it's interesting in a lot of uh, videos that I've watched or interviews with Martha Gellhorn she's saying about that we were warning people that you know we had to stop it here okay. um, and we did and because they didn't mm. the fascist won that then came on because obviously the, a lot of the mm. German units sent there um, to fight in Spain to kind of yeah. test all their equipment all the sort of you know the Luftwaffe and Stuka yeah. bombers they were all tested um, okay. and actually caused quite a lot of famous Incidents in, in the war, which we will go, go into now. But I, I found out as well that she used to live at the White House. Okay, oh. so in 1932, she actually assisted Eleanor Roosevelt with her correspondence and, and the First Lady's My Day column. Oh. Okay, so I mean, so she was very well known and very well crafted before yeah. she even sort of set off for Europe. Yeah. And I think she was the first lady as well to land at Normandy yeah. during D Day. I've yeah. since discovered there are actually 20 other female. Okay. Um, war reporters yeah. actually present at the time. So I don't know time. whether she went in with a wave before them, because I think okay. she went in with the second wave. Okay. Um, so maybe they followed on yeah. afterwards. But one of the things she was saying as well about the Spanish Civil War was that everyone saw um, the Republic Army as being red, as in like being communist. Okay. Yeah, in fact, she said all they were really was on the side of the people. So she actually describes okay. the Spanish Civil War as a battle between, a war between rich and poor, oh, which right. is really interesting because the American media ever since then has always classed anybody um, and she says the Viet Cong in, in, in Vietnam yeah. and uh, the, the people in El Salvador standing up and protecting themselves, yeah. um, the Americans framed that very much, well, they want to be communist and all that, whereas in yeah. fact all they wanted was to have their own land reforms mm. and stuff like that. It's mm. really interesting. So what did you find out about Martha Gilmore yeah. when you were doing your routing around? So um, I found out that she, um, yeah, so she went to Paris for a bit and um, she, she wrote, she, I think she was working at like a... Um, a, a publishing firm or whatever there um, but I think like due to actually um, sexual harassment she actually got fired um, I think I don't know if it was the editor or her boss but um, someone told her that um, we'll give you a pay rise if you sleep with me and she instantly said no and she got fired because of that so me too isn't anything new yeah it's been going yeah, on since it's been going yeah. on yeah. since um, yeah. and so she moved back to the US and um, I think things just started kicking off from there um, but yeah, so I found out that I think 
like Gerda Taro, she she's always been like overshadowed by Ernest Hemingway. Um, she has done quite a lot. Um, like for example, um, when she yeah, so like so during the time when um, so she actually got married to Ernest Hemingway, and I think during that time it was it was the traditional role of a woman to stay like to be a wife, to be at home and like um, always be there for your husband. But she actually defied all of that. Mm. And I think Ernest Hemingway didn't like that. I think he felt he was being emasculated. Um, the fact that she was always out there and he wasn't he wasn't able to do that. Um, and so the actual Normandy um, role, um, I think, I think it was um, I think she was actually going to do it, but he ended up taking that role. Um, because it was so her slot, wasn't it? Was it was her, her slot. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So she ended up going on a um, on a ship. She like snuck into a ship. I think it was like the medical ship. And um, she hid in the toilet, and um, she came out when they actually were like past like France or something. She couldn't um, swim back. It was too uh, far for her to swim back. Yeah, probably. yeah, yeah. They, yeah. Got, they couldn't so throw her like off. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, and that's how she she went to Normandy. So I think I, I was really inspired by her because she was she like persevered. Like she, even if there were any barriers like put in, in put in place, she would if she wanted to take out a story, she would do that and she would persevere and like. I love that passion that she had. Um, so yeah, that was really interesting about her. We've got a, a short film here, here, which is she's interviewed by John Pilger for The Outsiders okay. program in the early 70s. And she describes um, one of her main war aims was to get into Dachau on the day of liberation. Okay. So she actually arrived at Dachau concentration mm -hmm. camp and she gives the most blood curdling description of what it was like to kind of you know, walk around and see people. Because obviously we're a lot of our memories of that are driven by sort of black and white footage mm. or maybe some colorized footage mm. or documentaries that people have made mm. but to actually hear it from someone what was there kind of seeing it particularly around things like the infirmary and sort of the death trains and stuff like that it's um it's actually quite interesting i think she's an amazing woman actually mm. um probably one of the, the few that you could genuinely turn around and say well, i would actually like to meet her yeah um because of what she'd actually seen like that said so sure. a, a career that spans 60 years she literally went yeah. every, everywhere, particularly yeah. El Salvador, where she made a, a, mm. a real kind of nuisance of herself as well for mm. the American authorities and stuff. Okay, great. So that's number three. So we're going to go on to number four now. Um, and I think this lady is a bit of an enigma, actually, uh, Dickie Chappelle. Oh, yeah. um, and it, it's great, actually, because, I mean, she was actually a war correspondent photojournalist for the National Geographic. Okay. okay so it's kind of one of those strange sort of choice of a magazine yeah. to be a war correspondent for. And... Before Vietnam, which she's quite famous for, for her mm. Australian bush hat, mm. baggy clothes, um, big glasses, mm. um, and then also her pearl earrings, pearl famous earrings, for yeah. her pearl earrings. She'd already landed with the Marines, the US Marines in the Pacific, at Iwo Jima and yeah. Okinawa, two of their biggest, bloodiest battles. Yeah. Um, so she was already well known and well respected mm. by the US Marine Corps. Mm. So when she was actually killed, um, it was actually quite a shock. So she got various awards and stuff like that, and I think it's not made an honorary US yeah. Marine by the Corps themselves because the amount of time that she'd spent and I think they remembered not just what she'd done in Vietnam but the fact that she'd landed with them on, on these two major battles. Yeah. What, did, what did you find out about it? Because she's actually quite an interesting character um, compared to some of the others. I did a bit of research about her. I can't fully remember like everything um, but I do remember that she like she did want to be in the foreground again and she was very brave in like um, covering a lot of what happened in Vietnam um, but I think, yeah, she, she was a really, really interesting photojournalist. I think she loved being, like, in the foreground, like, trying to, like, she, she, I think she'd take a lot of risks to get a good photo, um, which is very interesting. And I, think, and I think it's very difficult to do that because your life is constantly on the line. And I think for a lot of these women, they knew their life was on the line, but they would still do that and they would still, like, get into all these tricky situations um, because they wanted to get that photo and they wanted to, like, raise awareness on what was happening. Um, so yeah and I think yeah. she was very keen to be a pilot as well and she's yeah. getting to that it's, it's almost actually when you read some of her childhood stuff it's kind of very tomboy kind of okay. actions like you know wanting yeah. to be doing what the you know, what the boys yeah. were doing because she wasn't allowed to yeah. and I think she was having an affair with someone at the, one of the pilots okay. at the at the um, at the airport so her mum sent her off to her gran in Florida and then oh, so wow. she then goes on and becomes Dickie Chappelle, okay. the war journalist. I think if yeah. her mum had just left her, she probably would have just been a pilot. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's quite interesting. Now, she covered the Hungarian Revolution in 56 okay. um, and was actually captured and jailed for seven weeks. 
So again, maybe not necessarily the sort of um, the dangers of sexual assault that we were talking mm. about before, but you know, being locked That's, up for seven weeks, I'm yeah. sure it wasn't uh, wasn't yeah. locked up in a hotel. Yeah. Um, it's it's the risks that come with it. I mean, are they the sort of things that would put you off? Because again, it'd be easy to have this conversation, be inspired by seven women, graduate from the University of Leicester with your degree, and then turn and go, actually, yeah. Yeah. John will show him the documentary <laughs> I make at the Documentary Media Centre. I'm off to, to cover a conflict, but you know yeah. it comes it comes with inherent risk. Is this something that you're reminded of when you when you read about these? Hundred percent, and um, and I think it, it kind of made it more real for me because you at the back of your head you do know that if you're going to a career like this, especially if you're going and you're doing like war, if you're like reporting on war, you're actually going to the foreground. Um, it does come with risk, but um, I think someone needs to do it. Like. If, if everyone's afraid of that, then no one's going to be out there sharing those stories. So someone has to take that risk to, to share the stories that need to be told. Yeah. One of the articles that I read in preparation for this evening, with, which I mentioned briefly earlier with the women that had been assaulted and stuff, that they were all saying that, you know, at the time, obviously it was horrendous, um, mm. thinking about their families and their kids and, you know, why am I in this situation? Mm. But every single one of them has returned to doing it even though they've got children and their family, because they said, you know, this is what I do, this is my job. And we, we kind of forget that, don't we? I think, you know, we look at maybe your Hemingways and your Robert Cappers mm. and, uh, and, uh, and other male names that we mm. could mention, but it's not about them, mm. see me. Um, that they're very kind of swashbuckling adventurers mm. and stuff like that. Well, these were the female equivalent of that, weren't they? These For people sure. were taking risks, Absolutely. pushing the boundaries, probably the glass ceiling as well yeah. when it came to what yeah. women were allowed to do, particularly in World War Two, yeah. um, and that they weren't going to return to what they did yeah. afterwards. They were going to carry on doing it. Yeah. Okay. So if you go on to the next photo, um, this is well, like I said, one of those ones where she, she very rarely captured the war fighting as such. Yeah. It was more about sort of the, the soldier, the US Marine mm. at, you know, in conflict, but yeah. being normal, being yeah. human. Okay. Yeah, and I think she really humanised the soldiers um, because I think back in before that, I think the like people who'd like take photos of war, it would be more about like the actual conflict that was happening and like the bombs or like more of the actual conflict. Um, but I think she actually wanted to humanise it all, and I think she actually took photos of the actual soldiers and what they were doing, like their mundane tasks and stuff like that. So that was interesting. Vietnam was one of those wars as well where you could pretty much go anywhere you wanted to with your press. Okay. Card, so you could get onto any military transport, plane, helicopter, vehicle, and go mm. anywhere you wanted. There was no restrictions. Okay. So after World War Two, where very much you were the equivalent of being embedded, yeah. I guess a bit like you were embedded later on with the Gulf War and stuff like. And obviously mm. Vietnam was the was the watershed for them not letting the press do anything. Yeah, to the, to the, the point where you had the Falklands war. and stuff, where it was all controlled. Um, World War Two was very much around sort of being. You know, this was us. We're who we're fighting. Mm. They're they're bad. We're good. Um, mm. This is, you know, us in battle moving forward. Vietnam was a lot more complicated, mm. wasn't it? You know, because obviously it's like, you know, peasant army, you know, and then you've got like the north, you know, these people just want to kind of, they, they got rid of the French, here's yeah. the Americans, uh, why are they yeah. here? We've got rid of the French, what's going yeah. on? Very, very complicated. It's, yeah. almost, uh, it's almost like a conflict today, yeah. but that was like 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. I mean, as a, as, um, a young person, mm. what, does Viet, what does the Vietnam War mean to you? Yeah. You know um, I think, well, well, it didn't happen like during when I was born, but um, I think looking back at it, you realise how I, I don't think things have changed much. Um, when I was reading the history of it, I think like I think China got involved a bit as well, um, and everyone was getting involved. And I think it's just a new way of um, I wouldn't say like colonialism, but it was just um, other countries interfering with a country which just wanted to be by itself. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned colonialism yeah. because obviously you know it was a French colony and, and so That's, you know yeah. and it's one of those few places that you know then the Americans came in the whole kind of domino theory mm. of like you know, if one country fell everywhere else would fall yeah. um, so again just a, another small country that's at the behest of someone tinkering in their in their, in, yeah. their, in their way of doing things. And I think that's yeah. still happening in other countries now. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. I don't think it's It's not changed, changed much, is it? No. no. <laughs> okay, cool. So we move on to the next one. Um, and so this we're still kind of uh, focusing on um, Vietnam at this particular time. So this is Catherine um, Leroy, and she's a French photojournalist and war photographer. And she took some really kind of star images mm. of battles. That was her thing for Life magazine. She, she really wanted to 
give give war a human face, but from the kind of the war fighting yeah. of it. And what's really interesting is that when you go into some of the other images that we're going to talk about, um, she's really interested in the actual battle scenes. So she was very close. She got very involved in it, mm -hmm. um, and particularly famous for one uh, particular battle called Hill 881, uh, which she took some sort of you know award-winning photographs for, where she went up went up this hill and actually went up the hill with them. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, for Life magazine, I think it really kind of changed the way that people saw what was going on, mm -hmm. and particularly you know it's, you can look at a photograph of a you know of her blonde hair. Um, yeah. She's actually quite quite small, um, and in fact she was the first female war correspondent to parachute do a yeah. combat jump into Vietnam as well yeah. she's totally fearless lost her press card for two weeks for having a go at a, a marine officer I think by because he she said he wasn't being very nice to her so she gave him what for and had her press credentials oh, yeah. pulled so she's a real kind of um one of those people that were in it and when you look at her backstory mm -hmm. as well she got a parachute wings at the age of 18 to impress a boyfriend yeah. You know? <laughs> and we, we talk about that with uh, Francois de Maudre as well later on mm -hmm. um, and then she said that at the age of 21 she bought a one way ticket to Laos in 1966 mm -hmm. with $200 and a Leica M2 camera wow. it's just like I'm going to go and find That's what's amazing. going on that kind of curiosity mm. to be able to do it and what do you think when you look at this photograph I think she looks quite brave to me yeah actually. All I that equipment, I don't know how she's standing up. <laughs> I'd probably struggle like to stand that up with that. Yes, I like the camera. That's a nice camera. Um, yeah, I think I was really fascinated about how she just like took a, bought a one-way ticket all the way to Vietnam. Um, and she, she knew that if, when I go there, I want to report on the stories that are happening there. Um, and until I do that, then I'll get back. Mm -hmm. And um, I just loved how that was so brave. Because for me right now to do that, I think... You would feel a bit scared just going especially if it's like a war war torn country like where war is actually happening it is scary to just like buy a ticket and let's go um so i think yeah she's she was very brave i think both that. her her and francois de molder both turned up in vietnam with no work so oh, they, wow. they literally got work from um, quite a famous um, male photographer that was running a, 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 one okay. of the bureaus out there and he gave them their first commissions and stuff so they kind of turned up with no work yeah. ready to go so literally they were there to find out and got, got themselves mm. involved in it which I think is yeah. amazing now um, one of the things that I found out as well about which was really interesting mm. looking at her later life mm. uh, because quite a few female uh, war reporters after Vietnam turned their back on that and did other okay. things her and Francois de Molder actually carried on Okay. Uh, doing conflict, covering quite a lot of conflict and we're going to come on to Francois in a minute but um, she literally went other places as well but she was really affected by PTSD uh, later on in her life wow. uh, that affected her um, and so uh, when she particularly um, not only just Vietnam but also when she was in the Lebanon and she actually yeah. won she was the first woman to receive the Robert Kappa gold medal award yeah. actually for the best published photographic reporting from abroad requiring exceptional courage and enterprise in 1976 when she was covering something in in the Lebanon so um, I think she was quite a fearless person and and when you look at um, if you flick onto her photograph there uh, that was taken on hill um, 881 mm -hmm. someone was saying as well her photographs very much they look like stills from movies it's, they're almost like the action so real it's like it's a still from a uh, from a yeah, film yeah, yeah. Uh, photographs that she took and um, they weren't meant to be well composed yeah, they yeah, weren't yeah. meant to be sort of artistic or anything like that just she unreal. she wanted to prove that she was there and you know and there yeah. and there were things going on now her most famous photograph mm -hmm. is the corpsman in anguish um, which is the next photo is the US Navy corpsman uh, Veron uh, Weeks you know which mm -hmm. is he's obviously as a corpsman you're the person that does the first okay. aid um, um, yeah. and that person there is his best mate mm -hmm. Um, and uh, they became a series, a series of three photographs yeah. became, became quite famous. And if you were ever going to humanise mm. war fighting and the impact on the individual, I think it's this series of this series of photographs and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, so. what, what do you think of that one when you see that one? The, the awesome. Yeah, I actually saw this before, um, and I've like the if you see the three photos, it's quite interesting because I think. I think the first photo was of him trying to like find his pulse and the next one That's was... That's that one, yeah. Yeah, and then the next one was trying to see if like he was breathing or whatever. And then the last one was where they actually find out that... He actually finds out that he's actually dead. Yeah, he's got um, his head on his chest. Yeah. yeah. And for a photographer, like standing on this side of the camera, I think like I can understand why she would have had PTSD after because it's like you're seeing this happen in real time. It's different. It's different like looking at a photograph like 
in the comfort of your home, but actually being there and taking that photograph. It, it takes guts to actually do that and just be present and taking that photo, um, which I think it's really brave of her. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Catherine Leroy, an interesting, an interesting yeah. character. So we're going to move on to um, Francois de Molder now. Um, now, this photograph that we're showing there, uh, which was taken, it was the battle for the Carantina Quarter in Beirut, and it shows a Palestinian woman uh, trying to speak to a Christian phalangist militant that's in front of a house that's been set on fire to kind of you know, yeah. stop doing what, whatever he's doing. And it actually won her the World Press Photo uh, Award, and um, she was the first woman to win that. In, in 19, 1977. And that's no yeah. mean feat when you think she's been all through Vietnam and all the conflicts that she's covered yeah. uh, to do that. Because again, that, it, it's not war fighting. You mm. know, it's, it's, it's a situation, almost a civil war, isn't mm. it? It's a civil war situation yeah. rather than what we would call a, a sort of like yeah. a Viet, the Vietnam War was uh, two sides of stuff. Yeah. But they said she really loved photography okay. and that she was a model and then she kind of got into, she went to Vietnam with a, with a, a, with a boyfriend that was a photographer. Yeah. and a bit like Catherine Leroy and, and quite a few of them actually, she's self-taught. She had no formal yeah. photography training, yeah. got a camera, taught themselves on, on the job as they mm -hmm. were going and got into it. I mean, what, what do you think of that photograph when you see that? They said that's her most famous. Her yeah, most famous I find one. it really interesting um, because there's a lot going on in that photograph because you can see um, the Palestinian woman actually like pleading um, to the other soldier, to the soldier. And there's like, there's like smoke in the background and, and like there's children and there's a lot going on in that photo. Um, and I think she was just at the right time like to take that photo because it has like mm. so much meaning. It just encapsulates what was happening during that time. She wrote later on that the, the, the young woman here with the child oh, yeah. um, survived oh, um, oh. and the um, militiaman here yeah. died in the game of Russian roulette. Wow. So, you know, the, the impact on different people, it's yeah. always like the person with the guns, always the perpetrator, but in yeah. fact sometimes Humor, the innocent yeah. people survive and then the person that's the yeah. perpetrator dies, dies in that way. Really that's interesting. Nice. Later on in her life as well, she developed cancer, and oh. and as you find with a lot of um, employment when it comes, particularly with anything that's media related, mm -hmm. but certainly sort of war, war photography and mm -hmm. journalism, is quite a precarious uh, profession to be involved mm. in. So she had no money, um, and they did mm. quite a big auction of her work, like a benefit yeah. auction of her work, organised by all of her friends in order to pay for her cancer treatment. So, you know, that was her her pension yeah. if you like or uh, the way yeah. that she that, that she survived she actually went off and she covered Vietnam for three years but she also covered Lebanon obviously where she's mm -hmm. won this Cambodia Ethiopia Pakistan and Cuba okay. um, and I think I've put another photograph in here this is the well, the most famous one of our second most famous photograph is the tank going through the gates of the presidential palace in Saigon with oh, the North right. Vietnamese forces okay. coming and they said that she was you'll notice with all of her photos there's a slight stand back distance okay. where she was always thinking about the composition and not being too close okay. so the difference between Kath her and Catherine yeah. Roy was very much there wanted to be in the moment yeah. whereas she was more about capturing it but kind of standing back and maybe yeah. making a bit more sense of it okay. as well which I think is, is, is quite interesting mm. in 91 she was actually in Baghdad at the start of the Gulf War as well so she was one of the oh. few female uh, female one of the few journalists in the city at the, when it started, the shock and awe started in 91. So again, she'd been very much involved in all of those um, kind of conflicts as well. And some of the photographs that we've got up here on her, on her display, yeah. particularly the one with the blue from Angola, you know, uh -huh. quite striking images, almost like portrait um, yeah. type stuff. And really, again, a very interesting character, but another French person, yeah. two French women. That's really interesting, isn't yeah. it? It's almost like they were fighting against something <laughs> anyway before they became yeah. before they became photographers. What do you, What do you think of this? Um, what do you think of that photo? I think yeah, it's a really interesting photo. Um, again, it could be any presidential gate, yeah, anywhere really, yeah. isn't it? it? Kind of very much reminds me of Egypt, Libya. Yeah, I guess you can take it like that as well. Yeah, so it could be. Um, I think like just trying to the whoever's like actually interpreting the uh, the photo, looking at the photo, um, that this could be in our country, like it could be happening here, um, which is very yeah quite scary, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and it's scary, yeah. yeah. But interesting photographs. Okay, so we've got um onto our last person, and the reason I've given you that photo to look at because again it's very much um you know Marie Colvin. Um, you know, British American journalist, foreign affairs correspondent, but she's very famous for her second photo, which is with the eye patch. Yeah. Um, 
a lot of people don't realise what she looked like before she had yeah. a, an eye patch. It's sort of kind of, I, it reminds me very much a few weeks ago when we uh, did a reportage club with Dave, who's in his wheelchair because of motor neuron disease. Yeah. You know, none of us know Dave pre MD. Yeah. We all know Dave as he is in his wheelchair. Yeah. And so, getting behind the character. Mm. And she's had a, a film made about her life in 2018. Rosamund okay. Pike plays her as well, um, okay. called A Private War, which is very interesting. It kind of gets behind the character. Mm -hmm. And you learn about when she first loses her eye. Yeah. She's with the Tamil Tigers um, in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And she's kind of advancing forward in the government forces. She actually stands up and shouts out, journalist, journalist, and they still fire the rocket. And that's when she got the, yeah. the shrapnel in her eye. So I think it's one of those things as a legendary moments when a legend is made about a, a, an individual, uh, what they do. So when you were doing your, your research about mm. um, uh, Marie Colvin, what did you mm. find? Um, so I found out that she, so she reported like, to, um, she reported on like quite a lot of conflicts around um, in Afghanistan, in, in other, like Pakistan, I think. Um, and her latest one was in Syria. Um, so she was reporting on the conflict that was happening there and then um, she ended up wanting to go into Homs where she wanted to report on like more of the conflict that was happening um, but I think her journalist friend said it's too risky let's not go um, but she's like as a journalist I'm willing to take that risk um, and so she chose to go and willingly she knew what risk she was going into and going into like into that arena um, so she goes into Homs and um, she ends up um, staying at um, staying like in one of the buildings and later on that that street is literally being bombed with um like basically being bombed and um she skypes i think people back in the west um about like um <laughs> she skypes people saying how um i'm just having a brain the freeze. situation <laughs> like you know what i mean yeah. but i mean i think also it's quite traumatic because if you watch that film uh, a private war a lot of the stuff that she's doing is like with civilians and people that are injured yeah. and visiting hospitals and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So again, it's not she doesn't report on the war fighting mm -hmm. as such. She's she's talking about the impact on civilians and yeah. and, and sort of you know really a lot yeah. of the stuff that she's doing back to the BBC yeah. or writing for the Sunday Times yeah. or live to CNN to Anderson yeah. Cooper is very much saying look you know this is annihilation. Mm -hmm. You know I mean there is no there is no mm -hmm. fighting here. Mm -hmm. This is the systematic slaughter of yeah. civilians. Yeah, that um, just reminded me. There yeah. are no soldiers here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um so she actually ended up um I think she was interviewing some of the people that were living there and someone actually said how um literally like Bashar al-Assad he's been given the green light to to kill us. So it was this woman with her children and her children were crying. Um, and um, she was actually interviewing the family and she was like, my children are crying and I don't know what to tell them. And she's like, we're being bombed right now. And I feel like <clears throat> Bashar al-Assad has just been given the green light. Mm -hmm. And I think sh she, as a journalist, felt that like it was a risk that she was willing to take because she's like, people need to know what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I think after, um, after she, 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 she got killed, um, a lot of the people, like a lot of the, of the news channels were talking about how like they had no other no other source that was coming from the area she, she was, was the there. only yeah. source yeah. so it goes to show that we actually need like we need people like that because there is no one else going to tell us what's actually happening around in the world um so yeah so i think she she did an incredible job and, and i think we need more war correspondents. now her family a few years after she was killed in 2012 actually took uh, went to court uh, with new evidence that they'd found that had been released um, okay. a leak saying that um, they deliberately targeted her to silence her that wow. she was so basically she was murdered or assassinated um, and so they actually won won the case and um, I think you know the Syrian government you know will never pay the money probably but yeah. you know they, they were found guilty of deliberately targeting her to silence her and what's really interesting for me um, and taking one step back to 99 mm -hmm. um, obviously it's from 2012 but in 99 mm -hmm. that you know in East Timor for example um, she was reporting uh, about the, the conflict that was there and she w refused to leave a compound and stayed with some UN soldiers and basically is, is credited with saving 15,000 women and children wow. and so when you think about it sort of uh, two, 99 to 2000 mm -hmm. you know 12 years later she's still immersed in the impact on civilians, women, children, that kind of stuff, and using the fact that she's there, almost like a human shield. I mean, yeah. they said, you know, without, without her being there, the, the Indonesian forces would have just come in and killed, killed yeah. those people. Um, so it, maybe she felt that she was that kind of human shield again as yeah, well, that she could maybe. physically yeah. get something done about it. But, you know, when you come up against a force like that, it's yeah. really difficult. But.
and, 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 and again an, an impressive person um, mm -hmm. with all the things that they've done from you know the Tamil Tigers she's the first I think she was the first person to interview uh, Gaddafi as well yeah, yeah. I, I think that. Gaddafi had a bit of a soft spot for her yeah um, it's quite an interesting scene in the private yeah. war where he just says to her like you know Maria like you know the, you know, the one person that I really <laughs> really like you know <laughs> slightly creepy you know yeah. that Gaddafi will like you in his own private mm. harem with all his other 400 500 yeah. women that he had um, I just think she almost for me is the epitome of a uh, the modern journalist but of that breed that doesn't really exist anymore you know she's up there with like you know Christine uh, Adam yeah. Paul um, those kind of people um, what, 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 what do you think she is as a, as a role model for um, going forward for someone like yourself I think honestly she when I was reading about like what she'd done I was like this is why I want to be a journalist because um, like especially when she went into home she knew the risk that she was going she was taking um, but I think for her it was like my life and like sharing a story she's like I need to tell people that story and okay my life's at risk but who else is going to tell that story and I think she wanted to be there at the foreground telling that story because um I, th I think no one else was there um and I think for me personally um there is so much going on in the world and we do need people out there I think I think even though it's a risky a risky job I think it's important to actually have some of have some of this like courage that these women had um, and use it in my day to day life um, in actually finding these stories because if no one else is going to do it someone has to do it and yeah now one final thing yeah. when you look at all of these seven people mm -hmm. the thing that connects them all together obviously is oh. they're, all, they're all dead at the minute yeah. um, so at the minute but they're, dead, they're, <laughs> dead. they're at the death as if they're coming back they're That's all dead the at the minute there we go it's been a long day isn't it um, they're all addicted aren't they they're all, they're mm. all that kind of not so much yeah. war junkie, but certainly sort of adventure junkie. You know, some of them were stories. training to be pilots, some of them were training to be parachutists. Mm. You know what I mean? So you've got this element of risk mm -hmm. already that exists in their life before they do that, yeah. and they take up these opportunities. Sure. And is that is that you? Is 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 that what you do? Do you do you see that as something that you I, naturally I, already feel? I'd love to 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 be like one of these women, but um. I, I can't say that I am like I think um, yeah like these women are amazing um, but is it something that would drive you on and inspire oh, you yeah, to do what yeah, you do obviously yeah. at university with the yeah. course that you're doing but your, your own Colours of mm -hmm. Leicester project the way that you could actually develop that yeah um, I think 100% like I do have this passion within me to actually because from the beginning I've, I've always when I, whenever I see like a new story I'm like okay like they're missing this out there's there's like a lack of this. Like when I read the news, like you see that they are missing out on so many stories that actually haven't been told. And um, I think that pushes me to actually want to do what these women have done. Um, and I think, yeah, and I think that's what makes me want to be a journalist and actually have a bit of their, do you know how they've been so brave and so courageous? I think I want to have that a bit like that in me. Um, and I think when I read the news, like something like a fire, but it does like, spark in my, in my stomach I'm like you know what I need to are go. you like where's my phone how much have I got in my bank account where could I get to you know let's book the next flight um, it's, it seems to work doesn't it well thank yeah. you very much for taking the time to talk thank to me that's great to that's yeah. good I um, hope you've enjoyed this reportage club um, please have a look in the links below for um, Coulson's links to the Colours of Leicester project okay. and uh, check out some of the other videos this is number four that will be on the YouTube channel and uh, we'll see you again next time